All right, John chapter 12 is where we're going to start reading this morning. Once again, I want to welcome all of our guests. Thank you. Grateful for the presence of the Lord in this place. Grateful for the word that the Lord's put on my heart. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing has she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might, might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. This morning, I titled this, my message, An Emptied Life. And just real quick, I want to pray again. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would lead and guide me in all truth, Lord God. I pray that you would use me, Holy Spirit, simply as a vessel. And that you would flow, that you would allow your word to flow like a river. That you would anoint it with the power of the Holy Spirit. That you prepare every heart to be receptive to your truth. I know that there's going to be much said in this message. Lord God, I know there's going to be much truth in this message. Much wisdom because it is your word. And I pray, Lord God, that you would help us to grab a hold of every word that you would have us for each and every one of our lives. That it would be real for us. That it would stick with us. That you would do what only you can do and that you would take the word and make it real in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, this has nothing to do with my message, but I just noticed that last little sentence there. Then they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he raised from the dead. You know, I can't help but think about the fact that that's really Christianity, right? That you and I, born the first time, were born like our father Adam, and so often in our life, we're really living in death. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I'm telling you, when we live a life that's filled with sin... The result of sin that takes place in our life, it results in death. But new life in Christ is supposed to result, according to the word of God, in resurrection life. And whenever you and I be raised from the dead in the spiritual sense, people begin to see that in our lives. And it draws others to come to know and want to know this Jesus. Amen. And that's what had happened in the life of Lazarus. In a physical sense, he was truly dead. And Jesus raised him from the dead really to prepare the people's hearts that they would be aware of the fact that he was going to also raise himself from the dead to prepare them to be receptive. You know, in this passage, there's a, I'm not trying to use big words, but it's a there's a juxtaposition going on. In other words, a comparison and a contrast specifically between Judas and Mary. He will betray or give Jesus over for his own benefit. She will give herself and what she has over for Jesus is benefit. I have learned that one of the ways I know when I'm in the spirit versus the flesh, this is for me personally, you do what you want with this, is when I make a decision that benefits the kingdom or others, while at the same time it's not always what's best for me. So something is being done in a way where I'm not always the recipient of the benefits. Yeah. I, whenever that happens, I know in my heart that's the spirit of God. But yet many times I make decisions. I'm just speaking about Matt again. Many times the heart and the flesh of man will make decisions that benefit himself right. rather than benefiting in what's best for the kingdom of God. Listen, don't, don't go too far with that. You'll know in your own heart and life whenever those situations arise. But most people in the church live somewhere in between these two. Not quite as close as Mary, <coughs> but also not quite as far away as Judas. Again, an empty life. I think that any person who really loves the Lord would be able to identify with several of the aspects of Mary's life. 
This particular Mary was the sister to Martha and Lazarus, and her family experienced a level of closeness with Jesus that most people in this time frame, they just didn't have. And what I mean by that is we see that, that they lived in Bethany, which was actually six miles from Jerusalem. And if you read the end of Matthew, the last week, starting with Palm Sunday to when Jesus is betrayed, it appears, if you study it close enough, that Jesus every morning woke up from Bethany, he walked to Jerusalem, he took care of his business for the day, whether it was rebuking the Pharisees or whether it was teaching about the kingdom. And then he walked back the six miles to Bethany where he slept. Many scholars believe, while we may not be able to completely prove it, that he spent those nights in the home of Lazarus, Martha and Mary. They really did enjoy, even whenever the Lord said that his friend Lazarus was dead. It describes the fact that Jesus had a very close relationship with Lazarus as a man who really wasn't part of his inner circle. Yet at the same time, Jesus had spent so much time with that family that he had developed a very close relationship. And in this particular story, Martha really more than anyone else is on the forefront of this story. And we see that there's a closeness that Martha, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm saying Martha, I meant Mary, a closeness that Mary made with Jesus that really surpasses most of anything that I have personally seen in much of the scriptures. The point is that Jesus was close with this family, but she stands out. She's hungry for more. And again, I think most Christians in some way can relate to her desire to be closer to the Lord. Because I believe that every true believer has had a yearning in their heart to be close to God. Amen? Amen. Sadly, many never press in where they experience that closeness that their heart desires. But they've at least felt that tug nonetheless. Can we all be real with one another this Amen. morning? Amen. There's always been a time in our heart and in our life, whether we were in our closet, on our knees, whether we were driving to work, we said, Lord, I want to be more like you. I want to press in. I want to get close to you. There's a, there's a yearning in our heart. You know what that is? It's because if you're really saved, the Holy Spirit lives in your heart. Amen. He's constantly calling you to draw closer. Because really, the Lord's not okay with just a peace. No. He's not. He wants you to do. He wants you to submit yourself. He wants Matt to submit himself completely to the Lordship of God. Amen. So there's a yearning in every true believer. If we're honest with ourselves, we will quit looking at the faults and failures of others. Oh, this is a good word. And we're so quick to look around at everybody else. Oh, they're not as close as I am to Jesus. They don't love him the way that I love him. They haven't studied the way that I've studied and all this kind of stuff. But you know what? If we're sincere, we'll quit looking at the faults and failures of others. We will quit judging our own walk in comparison to others. It's self-righteousness. It's a hyper, it's a critical spirit. It's not of the Lord. It's of the enemy himself. It comes from Satan. It doesn't come from the Holy Spirit. And what we'll say is that I need to be closer to the Lord. Amen. That's what our heart will say whenever we make that connection with Jesus. It's easy to get caught up in a place where we so closely look at others. And that we aren't focused enough on ourselves. Listen, this can happen to anybody. I didn't necessarily plan on it. But why don't you put on John 20. I'm sorry. John. Yes. John 21. Verse, starting at verse 21. See, I want you to see that this can affect even those that are the closest to Jesus. This is after the crucifixion. This is after the resurrection. Peter has gone off to do his own thing. His heart's hard towards God, but Jesus out of love. See, your heart might be hard towards God this morning. You, mean, but you might be like a Peter. I don't know. This is just line up right here. You might have one time been so close to the Lord, but right now where you are, you're kind of venturing away. But the Lord wants you to know that he'll come out to you. He'll come meet you on the shore. He's not, he, he's not, he's disturbed by the decisions that you've made. Just like he'd be disturbed by the decisions I make if I'd walk away. But he loves you and he will come out to you. Amen. And that's what he did. And he starts to speak to Peter. And he says, do you love me, Peter? And all of these things. And then in the end, look what happens. John, look at the scripture. Peter seeing him says to Jesus. No, I'm saying go back to the next verse for me. Jesus says unto him, no, no, I'm sorry, the, the one before that. 20. Yeah, 20. Then Peter, turning about, sees the disciple whom Jesus loved following. So here's Jesus. He's got it. I'm just imagining he's got his arm around Peter. And he's saying, Peter, look, you know, you, you say you love me. 
and you, and you ventured away from me, and you caused all of my disciples to follow you, and you're heading in the wrong direction. And I'm here to let you know I'm here. I'm by your side, and I love you. But listen, you got to serve me. And one day, you, you girded yourself. You put your own clothes on. But let me tell you something. When you get old, somebody's going to take your life, and they're going to hang you on a cross. You're going to die like that, but you're going to give your life for me, Peter. And you just need to, you just need to walk with me. You need to, you need to live for me. And then all of a sudden, the scripture says that Peter turned and he looked to the one that Jesus loved. And it's talking about John, the writer of the gospel. And the one which leaned his head upon him <laughs> his chest, that was John. He said, and that's John who said, and Lord, which is he that betrays you? When they were sitting there, he was asking who was going to betray him. And then now the next verse. Well, when Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what shall this man do? <laughs> well, why all this time, Jesus? I mean, I don't want to get too far in this because it's not that much of my message. But all this time, Jesus came all the way to the Sea of Galilee to meet you in your walking away state. Told you how much he loved you. Told you to come back to him. And you're so focused that all you see is that John's right there behind you because you're full of envy and jealousy. <laughs> Look what Jesus says. He says, Jesus says unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to you? Follow me. That's the word that Jesus would speak to each and every last one of us Hallelujah. in this room this morning. Don't worry about what the one on the right side or the left side is doing. You follow me. But it's easy to get caught up in that. The thing that makes Mary different was that she seemed to be willing to do what most people won't. She emptied herself in worship towards the Lord. I'm not talking about just a worship service or just decisions that were made to be seen by men. I'm talking about the fact that she touched the heart of God. Yeah. She heard the heart of Jesus. She stopped. She paid attention. And when she did, it changed her. And she gave what she had in obedience to God. Amen. So we can learn some things from Mary's life and they can greatly help our walk with the Lord. Her spirit heard the word of God. She submitted to what she heard. That's a good word right there. That's just the beginning to begin to understand the word of the living God. We have to learn by grace to submit to that word. That's what the word in the New Testament hearken means. It means to, to hear with the willingness to yield. Every last one of us, that's our problem in this place. I'm just being real with you. The preacher's telling you the problem with the heart of man, including the preacher, is yieldedness. Willingness, once again, to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. I can sit here all day long and tell you and remind you that Jesus came to die, to set you free, to give you new life. But if you nor I are willing to yield with the help and the grace of the Holy Spirit, our heart and our flesh will continue continue to live and we will continue to make decisions no matter how pure we think that we are oh, that are not really of the Lord but instead are, are because of our flesh. Us, Her spirit heard the word of the Lord. She submitted to what she heard and even though there was chatter in the room. I want you to know that. We're going to get to that in a moment. Even though there was chatter in the room she stayed focused and yielded to God instead of the distractions around her. She was unappreciated by everyone else, but Jesus took notice. People talked behind her back. People envied her and disliked her. But I also know that she enjoyed a closeness with Jesus that most Christians never will. I want to make this clear. It's not that she was any more special than you or I. That's right. It's not that God is a respecter of persons and he decided to give her a love for him that he won't give to anyone else. No, she just responded to the Lord. Again, she heard him. And she responded. That's point number one. She sat under his word. Can I say that again? Because there's a lot of meaning, even that little phrase I just said. She sat under his word. I'm not talking about sitting under a man. I'm not sit talking about sitting under a teacher or a preacher. I'm not talking about submitting to the will of a man. I'm talking about submitting to the will of the one who loved you and died on the cross to set you free. And you will be able, if you want to have a relationship with him and submit yourself to that, to hear the voice of the living God who spoke the world into existence. And now he would be willing to live in your heart and speak to you, to you personally, and have a relationship with you. I don't know about you, but that is a beautiful beautiful thing. She sat under his word. Look at Luke chapter 10 verses 38 through 42. Now it came to pass that they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house and she had a sister called Mary which also sat 
at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, you are careful or anxious in the Greek and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. I've preached this before. I've alluded to this passage before many times. I talk about Martha. I point out the fact that the, the difference between Martha and Mary, really right now, I think I'm seeing more of a con, uh, uh, between Mary and Judas. But I do want to make a point. Martha was distracted. She wasn't the only one distracted in this place. We'll see that many times even the disciples were very distracted. Life is very distracted. Your job can be distracting. Your family can be distracting. Come on, somebody. Just, let's live in the real world. Relationships can be distracting. Finances can be distracting. The cares of the world can be very distracting. They act like a thorn, is what the parable of the sower said. The cares of the world will grow up alongside the seed of the gospel and will wrap around it and choke it. Put a chokehold on it and cause it to die. In the name of Jesus, that you know, that we just got to be careful about distractions and obstacles in our life. She heard. You know the word heard right there means to give an audience. Are you willing to give an audience to the word of the Lord? Not, a, not Once again, not a word from a man, but the word of the Lord. How do you give an audience to the word of the Lord? Are you willing to submit yourself to God's word? Amen. To say, I need your word. <laughs> because if you're living in this scurried and hurried life and you're distracted by all the things of life and you're unwilling to hear the word, I don't care how bad the preacher is. If he's telling you the word, I'm just being real with you. The apostle, the apostle Paul said, you seek after Apollos, you seek after Cephas, you say you're of Paul, you say you're a Peter. I'm, no, he said, well, you're supposed to be of Jesus. And no matter, you know, he told that to the Corinthians. And he went on to say that you're carnal, you're not even spiritual. They were flowing with all the gifts of the Spirit, but he said you're carnal and you're full of flesh. Yes. Because you're all worried about this one and that one, and you're not even hearing what the Word of the Lord says. And I have learned the hard way by God showing me what's in my heart. It's not about who the preacher is, how charismatic he is, how loud he gets, how what, what he says that seems to... No, is he saying the word of the Lord? And in your heart, listen to me, you, sometimes we get so high and mighty in our heart. Oh, I just wish the worship was like that. I wish that... No, you know what? If we would... You can worship to a phone. Yes, right. If, the, if your heart's right, amen. oh, I'm telling you the truth. I'm preaching better than your amen, and, and it's okay. You don't even have to amen. I'm here to tell you the truth. It's the matter of our heart. Amen. And are we willing to give audience to the Lord, yeah. to the word of the Lord, and to humble ourselves? Because whenever we're hungry for the ways amen. of God, the word of God, give audience to him and submit ourselves, we will receive of him. Amen. Amen. Many times those distractions, oh, look at this. She gave audience to the Lagos, to the word. I've often wondered, really, what was the content of this message that she listened to so intently? By this time, Jesus had already started to predict his own suffering and death. These are some of the, the scriptures that he said right before this occurrence. All right. So this is chapter 10 of Luke. Let's look at a couple of scriptures that preceded this, just so we can get an idea of the things that Jesus was saying, because I can't prove to you what the content of this particular message was, because we're not told exactly what he was saying in this sermon. All we're told is that Mary's just sitting there at his feet, like sucking up every word that he's saying. And look at, look at this in Luke chapter 9, verse 21 and 22. And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. He's already predicting his death and his suffering. And look at 9, 20, Luke 9.23. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Well, there's a mouthful right there, bud. Yeah. Because see, this word right here is talking about the surrender I was talking to you about earlier. 
that you can know a whole lot. I can know a whole lot about the word of God. But if I'm not surrendering and not just yesterday or last week or three months ago or five years ago, but if I'm not surrendering to the truth of what God is saying today, yeah. then there's a good chance that I'm instead walking in the flesh instead of surrendering to the will of God at that moment in my life. The message that speaks of his death has far-reaching implications when compared to what they knew then. They only knew a little bit then. What I'm trying to say is, is that now we have received great revelation from the Lord. We understand and have more meaning of what this message of the cross actually means. I want to talk about it real quick. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I spend so much time on it. But look at 1 Corinthians 1.18 because we're talking about the Logos right now. That word in the Greek means word. She gave audience to his word. Yeah. She submitted herself to him. Look what this word says. For the preaching of the cross, the word of the cross, the logos of the cross, the message of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. You just think it's nonsense if you hear it. Hmm. It don't mean nothing to you. It's foolishness to them which perish, but unto us, who are saved, it is the power of God. Yeah. Amen. Real quick, I want to make something. I want to make a point to you. What are you going through this morning? What are you facing in your personal life? I say it every week. Yes. I say it on probably three times on Wednesday and at least four times on Sunday or something yeah. like that. <laughs> that the way that this message works is that you received Christ and in the mind of God, when you put your faith in Jesus, whether you knew it or not, your old man that was born of Adam, born bound in sin, dies, was buried with Jesus, and a new man has been resurrected to new this life. How did the song say? Yeah. No longer. The part about uh, now life begins with you. How did you made me new? Now life begins with you. You, you got born again. Yes. Jesus made you new. Oh. Now life yes. begins with you. That was just the introduction, man. Life begins with you. The minute that I submit myself to the will of God each and every day, he's ready to start putting life on the inside of me. So what is it that plagued you? You got a bad attitude? Guess what? He made you new. Now life begins with you. You, you got a problem with addiction? Guess what? He made you new. Now life begins. Oh, I already know that, preacher. You told me that last week. Guess what? I'm going to tell it to you again. He made you new. Now life begins with you. When it begins with you surrendering. He that will follow after me must take up his cross daily and follow after me. You're going to have to die every day. Not just every day, every minute. Hallelujah. So until you and I... Speak it to the preacher. Get to the point where we ain't getting all up in our flesh, hollering and screaming and want everything to go our particular way. No, we might not have gotten it yet. And the reality of it is, is that I'm here to tell you that I'm the first one that needs to be reminded that he made me new. And now life begins with him. And then I need to pick up that cross daily. My cross, like Bob Cornell taught me when I was in my flesh thinking I was a better preacher than everybody, that my, his cross is my cross. He was my substitute. Now I got to learn to hear, let him be my identification. I got to let myself be one with him. The old man died with him, not just yesterday. But today, she sat down at the feet of Jesus. She submitted herself to his word. I don't know what the content was, but I'm here to tell you about her actions later on in her life. And a few days later, yeah. show me that he was talking about his crucifixion and his resurrection. Show me that she heard the word that was coming out of the mouth of the master. Show me that she didn't just listen, but she surrendered Amen. and she obeyed. The scripture focuses right here on her sister, Mary, attentive to his words, and Martha distracted. But what about the others? Were they as attentive as Mary on that night? Were they holding on to every word that he spoke? Were they, I'm even talking about his disciples, were they paying as close attention to what he was saying as what she was? We all want to be closer to the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. 
It's sad to me that so many Christians think they understand God's word so well and think they're fine. Look at this. I put it. I wish I could show you. Comma, even myself included, comma. There have been times that I thought I was okay in my walk with God, just skipping along. I don't really skip. Just skipping along, but not really pressing forward. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, everything's fine. I'm doing good. Especially when I look over there at you. <laughs> I'm really doing okay. No, I wasn't okay. Because you know why? I wasn't like Isaiah. I'm not about to get into that, but that song talked about it, but it was yes, actually in my Lord. notes. It's sad to me that so many Christians think they understand, but they're not really pressing forward. More often than not, we become stagnant and make excuses for ourselves when we're challenged. We don't like to be challenged. Lord put it on my heart yesterday to say so, and I didn't even mean it the way it was taken. And you know what? Nobody likes to be challenged. I can remember the time that my boss spoke correction into my life, and what he said was true, and I didn't like it. And my flesh rose up, and anger rose up, and I could feel my face getting red. How dare he bring correction? What are you talking about, dude? He's your boss. Get a hold of yourself, man. He's your boss, and he has a right to speak into your life because he owns the company. And if you can't humble yourself under what, what your boss is asking you to do, how are you going to humble yourself under the, the, the hand of the Lord? If you can't humble yourself under your boss who you can't see, how are you going to humble yourself under the hand of God that you can't see? That's just common authority and being willing to be humbled. God places people like that in our lives, man. We don't like to humble ourselves. That's the problem. I'm telling you right now, I don't mean to go off on all this because it's not in my notes, but wives don't like to submit to husbands. Amen. Come on. Amen. Workers don't like to submit to their boss. Why? Because we don't like submitting to nobody or nothing. Right. And there's a place in our, but, but I'm going back to Mary. She submitted herself to the word of the Lord. And let me tell you something. You submit yourself to the word of the Lord. You will be willing to submit to your boss. Your wives will be willing to submit to their husbands, but hey, newsflash, husbands will be willing to submit to their sister in the Lord when their hearts aren't right. Yeah. Because before you was husband and wife, you were brother and sister in the Lord. That's a good word right there. It ain't always got to be the wife. No, it's a, it's a, you know, that's, that's a wrong interpretation. That's why nobody likes that scripture. It's a wrong interpretation, man. I, my mama, my poor mama, she's not here. She used to tell me, Matthew, this is what your daddy used to do. So my dad was in the Marine Corps. This is what this joker would do. Now that's why, now you know why I got such problems. All right? So you just have mercy on, you pray for me. My mama said my daddy come home from offshore and he literally, this old boy, he was a joker. He'd get a white glove. And he walked and put his finger up on the refrigerator. Oh, no. What is this? That's a problem, folks. That's an improper understand. I don't know why, just because I'm talking about submission. That ain't what I'm talking about. Do y'all understand that? I just want to make sure we're all clear. That's not what I'm talking about. No. I'm talking about we learn to submit to the Lord. We learn to submit to the word of the Lord. And guess what he's going to do? He's going to fix the heart of the wife. He's going to fix the heart of the husband. Hallelujah. And as we submit to the Lordship of Christ, amen, we're going to be able to submit to one another. To you. I'm going to be able to submit to you in time. Just because I'm the preacher. Come on. That's another problem I got. Don't let me get started on that. Church is elevating the man of God. Church is elevating the pastor. Whoa, hold on a second. No, a shepherd serves the sheep. The reality of it is, is that we're just an under shepherd. This is his body. This is his sheep. This is his house. This is his will that needs to be done. But we over here elevating men and wondering why we get so frustrated when they don't do what we want them to do. Newsflash. This ain't in my notes. I'm just saying I need to move on. Newsflash. I'm going to let you down. And guess what? You're going to let me down. And you're going to get irritated with me. And I'm going to get irritated with you. But if we learn how to submit to Jesus... We'll keep moving on and we'll learn from it and we'll grow from it because it ain't always going to go our way. And if you get irritated enough to leave, I just want you to know something. I'll always be ready to welcome you back. Somebody come up to me the other day and he says, he, for whatever reason, he had to leave. And he told me why. And I said, well, dude, I mean, look, I'm just here. I'm on your team, bro. I'm on your team. But I'm going to tell you right now what that preacher's telling you. You do what you need to do, but that ain't the Lord. That's a control spirit. But you're welcome to come back anytime you're ready to. 
if you ever go to another church and a preacher got a problem with you visiting somewhere else, that's a control spirit. Jesus said, I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Nico, control, laity, the people. You are Jesus' sheep, amen? And listen to me. Sometimes a season in our life will cause us to go somewhere else because the grass always looks greener. But I want you to know, even if you go and you visit somewhere else, you're always welcome back to this place because this is the, the Lord's house. This ain't nothing about Matt's house, amen? That wasn't in my notes, but we're moving forward. We're talking about submitting to the word of the Lord. We all need to come to grips with this reality. As you see, people are distracted. Peter was distracted in the passage I showed you. Martha's distracted in the passage that we're reading, right? We all need to come to grips with this reality. We can always move closer to the Lord. This goes back to that song that they sang. And if we think that we're good with God, don't get mad at me. I'm preaching to the preacher first. If we think we're good with God, we're probably not. I said it. We're probably not, look at this, Isaiah said in chapter 6, it was in the psalm, when he saw the Lord, he saw, he because that's what, that's what the psalm said, touch the coal to my lips, because you know why he said that? Because he said, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple with glory, and the seraphim, means burning ones, burning angels, cried, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the post of the temple began to shake. And he said, Woe unto me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live amongst the people of unclean lips. Let me tell you something. When you get into the presence of the Lord, you're going to be more like Mary. You're going to be crying and wiping the feet of Jesus because he's going to give you a little glimmer and a glimpse of what your own heart looks like. You ain't going to get up away from that encounter puffed up and prideful and thinking that you got you and God, you and God got something going on. No. What the Lord will do is he will show you and reveal to you your own heart. Now, he does a whole lot better job of it than Matt does because he's so much more kind and sweet. He knows how to speak and show you the reality of what's wrong and at the same time heal you at the same time. That's how God is. So if I stand up here and get on your nerves, guess what? It's either your flesh getting in the way. Come on, somebody. Help me out. It's possible. All right? Or, or just know this. The Lord wants to heal you. The Lord wants to soften your heart. The Lord doesn't want you to feel frustrated. The Lord wants you to see yourself. So that he can heal you. Amen. Amen. He wants Matt to see himself so that he can heal. Him. Amen. Amen. Some of the closest, some of those closest to Jesus had access to his word repeatedly. I want you to think about that. Here's Mary. She's sitting under the word of the Lord. She's being changed. It's just absolutely having an effect on her life. But some of those closest to Jesus had access to his word all the time. And it didn't always affect him the way that it was supposed to. They were distracted. You think that you and I can't be distracted? I don't want you to put this scripture up there, Mark 10, 33 and 38. I use this scripture a lot, but you know why? It's because I'm confounded by this. Look at this passage of scripture. This is Jesus saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes. And they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. Next verse. And they shall mock him and shall scourge him. That means to whip him. And shall spit upon him. You ever been spit on? I was on Bourbon Street with Lance Rowe and they spit on him. And I was like, how in the world did that man just deal with that? But then the next thing you know, some dude said he worshiped Satan and he slapped me in the face. And the Lord gave me grace to, to deal with that. So I guess that's how it is. But look at this. They spit upon your king. And shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. He's predicting all this. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that you should do for us whatsoever we shall desire. You see what's going on here? We want to sit at your right hand. I, this, every time I read this, it blows me away. That John, the beloved one, the one that laid his head on the chest of Jesus, the one that loved him and walked with him so closely, was one of the ones complicit in this situation. Jesus has just said, we're about to go to Jerusalem. Were they hearing him? I don't think they were. I really think they were distracted. Something was up because he just said, we're about to go to Jerusalem. They're about to spit on me, scourge me, ridicule me. Now, Jesus, we just didn't want to know something. Would you do whatever we desire? 
Hmm. See, that's the flesh, man. Yeah. The flesh wants what it wants in spite of what the Lord wants. The Lord's over here saying, I'm about to lay my life down. And they're over here saying, but will you give us what we want? How you miss that? That's what I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to say that in the midst of all of this, her heart gave Jesus an audience. Everyone and everything around her was trying to distract her, but she ignored the chatter. She gave an audience to the king, and I believe that because she did, on the day that she died, she heard those encouraging words that every believer should want to hear. These are the words, if you're a Christian, that you want to hear when you take your last breath here and your first breath there. You ready? Matthew 25, 21. <laughs> His Lord said unto him, well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter you into the joy of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I want to hear those words one day. Amen. 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 So that was point number one. She sat under his word. The next points are a little quicker, so we're going to move along. Point number two. She was so close, she smelled like him. Look at verse three of Luke chapter 10. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spike nard, very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. This amount, a pound in re is really about the volume of 12 ounces to about one and a half cups. The value was about a year's wage. Some scholars say about a whole lifetime of saving, I guess, depending on how good a saver, saver you are. So it was very expensive. And this spike nerd actually is two words put together. It's really nard was the name of the stuff. It was nard. And the spike is the head of the plant that would, and it would harvest it. And when you squeeze it, this very aromatic and sweet smelling juice. I'm almost positive the word is actually valeria. And where I believe that we get valerian root. But I can tell you one thing. Obviously, the head of that thing doesn't smell like the root. Because I don't know if you've ever taken valerian root before. But I take it every night. And it ain't smelling good like this. But nevertheless, whatever this stuff was, it smelled very good. This nard. And it was made in ointment. And it was extremely expensive. And he, she had held on to it. And she had saved it. I've said this before. But I think it bears repeating. Everyone in that room was close enough to smell the ointment. But she was the only one close enough to smell like him. You know, I don't care if you're a woman or a man, whether you're hard or soft, emotional or emotionless. If you're unwilling to get alone and get close to Jesus, you will never really look like him. You will surely never smell like him. See, I imagine a fragrance following her when she left, the smell of Jesus trailing behind as she walked down the street. People probably said she smells like him. She looks like him. Look, she even acts like him. See, when you give audience to his word and spend time close to his presence, you will respond differently to situations than a normal person would. Right. You still will get hurt. You still will feel pain. Yes. But you will learn to respond differently than the normal Christian would. Amen. Because you will be close enough to the heartbeat of God that you will respond like the spirit, selfless, instead of like the flesh, selfish, mm -hmm. and what's best for me. That was point number two. To get close enough to him where you begin to smell like him and begin to respond like him. Point number three. There's a snake in the garden. See, then saith one of his disciples, verse four, Luke chapter 10. Then says one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And had the bag and bear what was put therein. The snake was there in the beginning to twist the word of God. He showed up thousands of years later dressed like Judas to betray the Lord. And no matter who you are, if you make a move towards Jesus to grow closer to the Lord, to give audience to his word and get close to his presence, if you make a choice to allow him in a sacrifice to be the most important thing to you so you can be used by the king, you can expect the snake will come. And let me tell you this. Cold-blooded reptiles aren't always easy to see. In the cold, their movement slows down. Lizards change colors and adapt to their environment. And people have a way of posing as one thing, yet they're completely different. And here we have Judas. He's so against what she's doing. And what he seems seems practical. Her behavior is just too much. 
right? Have you ever been around someone who loved Jesus too much? You know what I'm talking about? Come on, don't say yes too fast. Have you ever been around somebody who just loved, man, that person just loved Jesus too much? I'm not talking about a weirdo, man. I'm, I'm being real with you. I'm not talking about some flaky weirdo kind of thing. I'm talking about somebody in, uh, who genuinely loves Jesus yeah. and wants to just talk about Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Is it wrong to want to talk about Jesus? I mean, okay, I get it. Joe Burrow, wow. You know, I mean, did you see that dude last night? If you watched football, he probably didn't even watch football. Okay, if you watched football and you saw that one play he made, wow. But what about Jesus? Is it okay to talk about Jesus? Good, Joe Burrow, win the Heisman. You deserve it, dude. And yeah, you're going to probably be a first-round draft and get millions of dollars. But what about Jesus? Is it a problem for us to talk about Jesus in public? Huh? To tote your Bible around and let other people know that you love him and that you live for him? No, it's not. It's a good thing. Amen. Praise God. And he, but he's so against what she's doing. Because let me tell you something. When you start living for the Lord, I've experienced it in my own life. I've shared this with y'all before. That dude, Lance Rowley, used to carry that cross. And I went, ended up going with him after the Lord got a hold of me to Bourbon Street. Walked, I mean, look, it ain't nothing about me right now. I'm just telling you. Walked up with him on Bourbon Street with him carrying that cross. And he stuck that thing in the middle of Bourbon Street. And by that time, the Lord, had, the Lord did a work in my life about boldness that night. But do you know, like about five years before that, he showed up in town for the first time. And my father-in-law was so enamored by him, he invited him to come eat. And I was sitting in the living room watching the Saints. They had just hired Mike Dicka, so it was probably more than five years ago. Yeah. So it's been a while. And I'm over here, like, watching the game. And here they are talking about Jesus. And all of a sudden in my head, this is an old snake, Judas, the devil. Come on. He's done it to you. He's done it to me. He said, hmm. I bet this dude don't even love his love the Lord. Look at him. Look what he's doing with his family. Carrying him all over the country in this bus. Flesh. Envy. The heart of Judas. The heart of the devil. That man, all he wanted to do was live for the Lord. All he wanted to do was tell Jesus, I, look, the Lord at this point hadn't called me to do what he did. But I'm so glad that I got to spend that one night with him because I'm telling you right now, it forever changed my life. I know I tried to I tried to copy him. I got me a cross bill with some wheels on it. Y'all y'all might have seen me in the past. I was told that thing. I called the police department up. I said, hey, look, dude, I got me a cross. And I don't care if you think I'm weird. I really don't. I did it. And I'm glad I did it several times. And I might do it again. If my heart gets right, I probably will. Just praying the whole time, Jesus, lover of my soul, kill me while I walk down this road with this cross. And how many times did people stop and say, dude, and, and just how many times was I able to pray with people? And how many times, do you, praise God, you'd be surprised. What God can do through something like that. Whether you, were, I'm not asking you to build a cross and do that. The Lord never told you to do that. Calm down, man. I'm not even asking you to come to the Shrimp and Petroleum Festival. I got Nia and Angie and Troy. <laughs> Praise God. We hit the streets this year. It was good. God's got to show you what to do. Amen. Amen. But anyway, he's so against what she's doing. He's so full of envy. Her behavior is just too much. I'm talking about somebody that's genuine and just wants to talk about Jesus. The same spirit that was in Judas will be in others around you. And if when you make the decision to get close to the Lord and stand for the truth of his word, I promise you that it will happen. Satan will make sure that it does. It's his job to frustrate and antagonize you. It's his job to try to stop you from getting close enough to Jesus to where you get a revelation of him and his word. Because if you do that, you will become a selfless vessel. And that, my friend, is a problem for the devil and his kingdom. I can remember when I... Got home. I was in detention home for however many week for however many weeks I had to go to a rehab, so I didn't have to go to jail. And I got home from this rehab thing, Greenville Spring State Hospital in Baton Rouge. And I'm telling you, I know I've shared this story before, but every single time I was, I mean, I know I was a little boy jail kind of thing, but every time I was locked up or had to go to one of these rehabs, three rehabs by the time I was 19. Every time that happened, the Lord sent somebody there to tell me about Jesus. And some of them were back. Thank God for the Baptists. Because yes. at least they came and talked to me about Jesus. And every time somebody came and talked to me,
me about Jesus, the Lord would deal with my heart because my older sister had already been telling me about Jesus. And I had already as a child gone to Twin City and gone up to the altar. So the Lord was already stirring it up in me. But I can remember as I got out, I'm just telling you the truth. I had stolen a BMX bike from my old friend Darren Vaughn in Houston, Texas. I said it on the video. So if you ever wonder what happened to your bike, I doubt, I doubt you'll watch the video, dude. He lived in Houston. I went to two friends. We went to Houston one night. I went to go knock on Darren's door because he was cool. And there his bike was at the door. And I said, oh, nice bike. And I just stuck it in. That's how jacked up I was. Lord, help me. But Troy <laughs> laughed. But anyway, I had that bike and I was riding around on it like it was mine. The Lord had dealt with me a little bit when I was in that detention home. Yeah. Went through that whole rehab thing, got out. So I'm just saying, like I was on my little stolen BMX bike riding with my friend. And all of a sudden I said, hey, man, you ever thought about Jesus? Because the Lord was dealing with my heart. Right. And I was, the Lord was trying to get me to bow. And then I remember he said, Jesus. And it's like I just shut up. I just shut up, shut down. Didn't say nothing else. Went back to my old way of living. Listen to me. The enemy's going to make sure that he sends an antagonist your way when you make a decision to move closer to the Lord. It might be at work. It might be a family member. I don't know who it is or when it's going to be, but I'm here to tell you, he will always have a dissenting voice to put into your life to cause you to draw back. Look, be prepared for the talk. Be prepared for the chatter. Be prepared for the gossip. Satan will always talk behind your back and try to prevent you from doing what God has called you to do. But you and I need to be like Mary and ignore the chat. I call the chatter distraction. I'm closing with this thought. Yeah. Naya, you can go ahead and come up to the front. I can remember when I was a young boy playing baseball. Anybody in here, if you ever played baseball before, I was so silly, man. I really wasn't that good in baseball. I was a lot better whenever I played football just because I was more aggressive. But... I can remember, and I couldn't hit the ball to save my life. And I can remember playing catcher. And I would try to give them batters the biggest problem. I'd be back there, hey, batter, batter, batter. I was like, why are you not swinging? You scared you're going to miss? Come on, batter, you scared? Why you won't swing at the ball? Then they swing and miss. See, I told you, batter. You look, you, you miss. And I'd tell them all kind of stuff. Bad about about a distraction, trying to aggravate you. I know that the umpire was going crazy. Like, this kid is out. <laughs> bad about about a. Whenever you try to move towards Jesus, that's what the enemy's going to do. Bad about about a. Look at you. You look so funny. Yeah. You look so silly. The world's laughing at you. Let them laugh, church. Let them laugh. Let them laugh. You and I need to be like Mary. We need to lower ourselves and submit ourselves, not to a man, but to the, the man and to his word. Amen. We need to obey the word of the Lord. We need to learn how to surrender ourselves. Amen. Despite all the distraction, let us hold on to Jesus.